one of the primary demonstrations of truth in the crossing of the Red Sea in the account of the Bible is the absolute imperative nature of laying the ax to your past. Severing completely the ability of your past to affect your life. It's amazing how much of the difficulties we experience in our life simply relate to not being able to get away from our past. Just as surely as, the, uh, as Pharaoh's army chases the Israelites, your past is going to chase you. But as long as your past isn't severed from behind you, as long as that, that, that thing is still back there some way, then it's going to pull you back into captivity again. Often the same kind of captivity you got delivered from because your expectation is shaped by it. And it could be somebody else's expectation. Oh, well, brother, nobody has ever gotten healed of this. Or very few people, you know, have ever successfully overcome that. Or the only way is this horrible procedure that you bear no witness to at all, whatever. And this is other people's past experiences being imposed on you by all of the well-meaning, <laughs> I won't call them what they really are, but they're well-meaning people trying to tell you, you know, um, what wisdom about this really is. So your past has to be severed. It has to be severed completely. Its ability to control your future has to be severed once and for all. Amen. And so we're going to look at the Word and extract some principles that will enable us to completely and totally sever your past from you. And don't sit there and look at me and say, oh, well, you know, my past doesn't control me. When you think about how that person treated you and the bitterness and bile begins to rise up, when you think about how it was not to have enough food, money to put food on the table and that fear begins to stir, don't tell me your past is severed from behind you. Yes. And so what do we see in the example of the crossing of the Red Sea that is so important? Verse 17 of Exodus 13. Exodus 13, 17, and we'll put the Scripture on... Um, the screen. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent, or means, which means change their mind, when they see war and they return to Egypt. So God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. The Hebrew word harnessed means by ranks of five, is all that means. Five to a rank. But God led them a way that was not logical in man's thinking, not probable in man's thinking. So the first point of how God's going to deliver you how God is going to lead you after deliverance has initially been effected through the blood of Jesus. When he brings you out of your Egypt, he's going to lead you in what I might call, usually, a surprising way. It's not going to be the way of human rationale. That's the lesson that's being taught. It's not going to be the shortest way the way that would seem to be the most appropriate way. At this point in time, you're going to be led they were, just as surely as they were led by a pillar of cloud. You're going to be led by a cloud too. It's called the cloud of glory or you could say the presence of God. And for us in our covenant, that means the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. So when it's time to decide 
what you're going to do once deliverance has initially been effected uh, in your life, been, uh, you know, experienced, then you need to realize that if you have to rely solely on human rationale, you'll probably go back into captivity. And so you need to listen to the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. And if you're married, the two of you together always come to a more likely conclusion than one alone. This is what agreement is for. But it's likely to be a surprising way that the Lord leads you. Certainly not simply by human rationale. Now, God's not against reason or using your brain. He gave it to you. He created it for you. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 118 says, Come, let us reason together. Amen. The problem with secular humanistic reasoning is that it doesn't have enough information or truth to use in the rational process to come to a proper conclusion because the most important truths of all are re revealed in the Bible. And that's why God says, come to me. Let us reason together because now you've got the truth you need to begin making a proper decision. So God's not against human rationale. He's just against basing your decisions on the natural criteria you have before you because that's never enough information. Some of the most important decisions you'll make to stay out of captivity is what you do with yourself when that captivity actually happens, uh, when it's a you actually experience that deliverance. Now, you pray. You listen for the inward witness of the Holy Ghost. You get together with your husband or wife or another believer that you're close enough to, to be able to pray with and agree with. And I believe peace will come and direction will be found, and it might surprise you that the way you're going to go. Then let's look at uh, 14, chapter 14, verse 9. 14, 9. But the Egyptians pursued after them, and this is what your past will do. Your past is going to chase you. Whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's cigarettes, whether it's some form of uh, chronic infirm infirmity, whether it's never having enough money or lack, whether it's you just don't get along with people very well. And there's some people, they can't get along with themselves, much less anybody else. But whatever uh, it may be, your past is going to pursue you. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army overtook them by encamping at the sea. I can't pronounce those words, so we'll go to the next verse. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And, of course, the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Well, you know, at this point, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of, of years past. I think we were at a point of deliverance and then we, uh, in some area, and then we'd have another low week or another, you know, and I'm looking back at the past and saying, oh, no, here it comes again. And that's exactly what they did. And so basically in verse 13, Moses, when they lifted up their voice to the Lord, said unto his people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Amen. This is God's intent to completely sever your past from behind you so that it has no capacity ever to trouble you again. Amen. Amen. I love that, that terminology. Again, no more, forever. forever. Say that. 
Again, no more forever. One more time. Again, no more forever. Amen. Amen. And then verse 14 says, The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift up thy rod, stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Down to verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Verse 28, And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on the left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. That's what he will show you. If you go through this process the same way they did, you'll look at your past and you'll see it dead on the shore of your faith. Amen. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians and the people feared the Lord, means reverenced the Lord, and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. So let's go back to verse 13 and pick out some points. The first thing that I said you're going to need to know is that it might be a surprising way that he takes you. And it may seem impossible, just as the children of Israel must have thought. Why are we going this way? We got a Red Sea in front of us and the enemy behind us. We're trapped. It might look utterly impossible to you, so it might be a surprising way. But the next thing God says to you is fear not. Amen. Fear not. Amen. Fear not. Because once you fear, your faith has been engaged. It's the same force as faith. Your believing has been engaged without you even wanting it to be engaged. But fear is rooted on the negative consequence you believe is going to come to pass. If there was no fear of negative consequence that might come to pass, then, you know, you are free to a significant degree already of your past. Because the natural circumstance that draws the wisdom of man is always going to, you know, seem rational to the natural mind. It's going to be something that it's happened to other people. Other people got killed by this same army. Now we're trapped by them. Other people experienced this same thing, didn't make it. So you have to deal with the fear. And under our covenant, God says, he hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. That means three things for us, a threefold cord that will destroy the force of fear Amen. that God hasn't given you. The first is power. There are two sources of power in the believer's life. Use them both. One is Holy Ghost dunamis power, miracle working power. I have used my prayer language, tongues, in the cockpit of an airplane before when it was really a, an uptight situation and fear left just completely disappeared. But there's another source of power that is us to usward who believe. So when you start filling your mind with what God says instead of what the circumstance says, faith grows and fear diminishes. 
So the first thing you've got to do to combat fear is the power of God that's available to you. The second thing is the love of God because fear is always turned inward. It is always concerned with self. When you love, you turn your attention outward. You turn your attention to the, you know, the people that you're loving. Could be God, could be somebody else. But when you love, you give of yourself to them. There's nothing better you can do to get rid of your past if it's harassing you and fear is becoming a problem than to go out on the streets and do a little witnessing or begin sharing your faith with somebody else or do something to start helping other people and get your mind off of yourself. And speaking of the mind, the third consideration is a sound mind. God defines a sound mind as one which casts down vain or empty imaginations and brings every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So if you do these three things, if you tap into the power sources that God's made available to you, if you focus on other people instead of yourself, which is what love does, and if you cast down vain imaginations, fear will be broken. That's a threefold cord. Fear can't get in if you do those things. So the second thing we see after fear, it says, stand still. Stand still. Fear you not. Stand still. This is verse 13. And see the salvation of the Lord. The word still doesn't mean don't move a muscle. Still is defined as firm. Stand firm. Stand your ground. And this says to me, uh, like the New Testament reminds us, that the wavering man, the double-minded man, receives nothing from the Lord. So don't even let your mind go to any other possibilities other than your deliverance. Stand firm, hold your ground. I don't care what the doctor's report says. I don't care what the bank balance is. I don't care what your used-to-be friend called you. You stand firm. You are who God says you are. You are the delivered, just waiting for the door to open. You stand firm. So the first thing you do is fear not. The second thing you do is stand firm. In the next verse, we see the phrase, hold your peace. Hold your peace. We could spend a lot of time here. The peace of God garrisons about your heart and mind. Regardless of the circumstance, you can find peace in the assurance of faith. And of course, uh, you know, we are told that we are to look on these things in Philippians. We are to look on these things, and it names off a bunch of things there that I can't remember. You know, everything that is a praise, pure, lovely, good report, honest. Keep it coming. Okay, that's all you can think of? No, that's okay. But basically, uh, I mean, think on good stuff. Think on Bible stuff, good Bible stuff, and you'll preserve your peace. But one thing this means, and one translation, I think it's the message, actually uses this terminology, shut your mouth. <laughs> and I'm reminded of Joshua, you know, telling the children of Israel, don't you say a word. Six days around the walls, don't <clears throat> you say a word. A word. Same principle. Hold your peace. Because when the enemy's behind you and a sea of impossibility is before you, it'd be real easy to say, I want to go back to Egypt, wouldn't it? So God says, hold your peace. I think it means hang on to the peace of God. The garrison's about your heart and mind, but it also has the application of 
watching your words. And then in the next verse, which would be verse 15, the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ said unto me, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Now, this just fits in perfectly with the New Testament because in Philippians 3.13, we are told to forget that which is past and reach forth into that which lies before. See, they've, they've, they've been doing the things to forget that which is past. They've dealt with the fear issue. They're standing firm, not wavering a double-minded, and they're holding their peace and or their tongue, however you want to view that. And so fear is moving into that place of oblivion that 313 calls forgetting that which is past. To forget simply means to put out of mind in the Greek that which is past. Now you can reach forth into that which lies before. Or who says it's that way? Who says it's that you have to forget that which is past before you can reach forth into that which lies before? Or could it be that reaching forth into that which lies before is how you forget your past? Amen. But these things are for your consideration, and your perusal. But this, these are ways that you sever your past forever, forever from behind you. And the children of Israel must have been saying at this point, oh, time. They must be saying at this point, how can we go forward? There's, there's a motion in front of us. And so Moses is then told to stretch out his rod. In verse 16, now hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. It sounds just absolutely impossible. But, you know, I mean, they must have looked in front of them and said, how can, that, how can we go forward? So Moses stretches out his rod in obedience to the Lord. God always uses a man. And the sea splits. And it's not too much longer after that that they look back on the shoreline and they see their past dead before them. God will show you the death of your past. It'll be so definitive. It'll be like looking at a dead body lying on the shoreline. Its ability to ever interfere with you again. And this is necessary to complete your deliverance in a way that, you know, you're not going to go back into captivity again. These are necessary steps that must be taken. But as we begin to bring this down, I want to make a couple of other points to you. Do you, you know, a lot of times, you know, and I think, I still remember, you remember Charlton Heston playing Moses? Yes. I mean, uh, you got to be of my generation, I guess. <laughs> Who's he? You know, well, I don't know. Forget you. Uh, basically, that's what I see. I see old Charlton Heston sitting up there stretching his rod out, and you see the water pile up and the sea split. But that's not the way it happened. It's important to note in this account that the wind of God started blowing, and the, the word wind is the same as spirit. So for us, it would be the spirit of God starts moving. And you know that, but they had to watch and wait all night long. This is the night of the darkness of the soul just before the dawn breaks. You know, it's not always going to be an instantaneous miracle. And in fact, I think the Lord's telling us, you're going to have to stay engaged in the process for more than just one or two minutes, Amen. and then you see a miracle. You may sense that your miracle has started, but you can't see anything. It's dark. It's still a little bit scary out there. And the thoughts begin to try to assail your mind. But you have to stay engaged because the morning's coming. And God's promise is when the light 
breaks, you'll see the sea parted and your miracle is ready to step into. But just stepping into a miracle, think about this for a moment. I mean, towering 200-foot walls of water on either side of the dry land. Think about the faith it takes to step into a miracle, to step into something that God is doing that is absolutely miraculous. Fear could actually enter in right here. Oh, no, 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 no. No, we better not go that way. Too risky. Look at the walls of water here. No, no, when the miracle starts, you on a heart level will know it. And yeah, it's going to take some courage to step into that miracle, but you must. Can you imagine how that really was? I mean, these walls of water, there's nothing holding them back. This visible to the naked eye. But they, they took their step. And here's another little thing, a little tidbit for thought. Would they have taken the step if the enemy wasn't pressing them from behind? Amen. Oh, Lord, just deliver me from this pressure and this tension. Oh, Lord, I don't know how much more I can take of this, this, you know, this fighting, this fear. Well, God says in 1 Corinthians 10 again, but he says that he's not going to let you experience adversity beyond what you're able to bear, Amen. but will make a way of escape. Amen. And so when you're getting ready to step into that miracle, you see it as your way of escape. You take a deep breath and you take that step of faith and walking it out will be a life-changing experience. You'll be able to look back on the shoreline of your faith and see your past dead behind you. Before we go, I want to remind you to go vote on election day. Our ability to elect our leaders is God-given, so don't take it lightly. Research the candidates that are on your ballot at the city, state, and federal level, and then vote for those who will stand for principles that align with God's Word. Thank you for joining us today. Tune in again soon for our next broadcast. And until then, remember, God wants you to win in every area of life.